Okay. In a second you should see this. Here we go. Excellent. So welcome everyone. So great to have lots of people online and I have been, I've done two or three actually webinars now um, in light of remote teaching and learning and school closures and so on. And um, they've been very popular because everyone, everyone's been thrown into the deep end. So <laughs> welcome to this one. This is a more specific one for band, orchestra, choir leaders, in fact, any ensemble leader of any type. Um, I just named those three things. But before I get started, a little bit about me if I haven't met you before, if you haven't seen me around. Um, so my name's Katie. I run my own business, Midnight Music. I am what's known as like a digital learning coach for music teachers. Basically, I help music teachers specifically with technology-related things. And I do lots of live workshops. I do online training. I have a podcast. I'm a blogger, a speaker, I do keynote spe uh, speeches every now and again. And um, the biggest part of what I do is actually run an online community, which is a professional development space for music teachers, which has lots of courses that you can do and tutorials all around using technology in music teaching. I have two boys and a dog that you can see in the picture there. That's Jamie, Josh and Ella the dog. And um, the podcast, if you haven't already subscribed to that, I would love you to do that. It's free, of course, and it's all um, me talking all about music tech tips. Sometimes I interview people and I'm planning on doing that a couple of times in the next uh, two or three weeks or so is to pick some people that I'd love to chat to, particularly about this remote learning situation that we're in right now. So a little bit of housekeeping before I get started. If you have any tech issues at all, the best thing you can do is try refreshing the browser. If you haven't already logged into the chat window, you can do that now. I can see we're approaching our maximum limit of 500 people in the chat window. I had a feeling we would get there today. If you cannot log into the chat window, it doesn't matter. It just means that you can't type anything. You can still view the session, no problems at all. And if you have a burning question that you don't get to ask, you can either hang around right till the end where I know people will start to leave the session because they need to go do something else and then type then and log in then. Or um, you can send me a follow-up message and I will try and get back to you. I'll give you some options for how to do that a little bit later on. Now, on the session today, uh, the lovely Martin Emo, who's based in New Zealand, has joined me and he's going to act as an, a moderator or administration uh, person for the chat window. And Martin will answer some questions as we, we go along. If you know the answer to someone else's question in the chat window, please feel free to help them out. Um, the, the, I ran a session on Friday and everyone was really good at helping each other out. I won't be able to check in on the chat until the very end. It's just a little bit too disruptive and particularly when it's such a large group of people. Martin will do his best and if your question doesn't get answered, don't worry, hang around until the end and you can ask it again at that time and we'll get you sorted. Now, I will also say a copy of the slides that I'm showing today are going to be provided to you. So feel free to take notes, but just know that you will also get a copy of the slides as well. And as I mentioned, we will uh, do the question and answer time at the end. Last few things, the session is being recorded. What will happen is if you registered for this session and received emails from us with the link and so forth, you will get sent a link to the replay page where you can watch this again or if it goes on for a long time and you need to leave and you want to finish off, you'll be able to watch it there. There will also be on that same page a copy of the slides uh, with the download link there. There will be a link to the PD certificate form, but I will also tell you the link at the end of this session so that you can go there earlier than when you get the link to the replay page. Now, the link to the replay page, we will get out. We need to set it up a little bit, so it will be done and sent a um, maximum of 24 hours from now. It probably will be done a bit sooner, but I'll just let you know, you need, might need to wait around 24 hours. And the last thing I'll say is that I do a free training session like this every single month. The ones that I'm doing this week are in addition to my normal monthly live training. I've sort of popped in a few extra ones. 
The next uh, regular monthly uh, live training session is actually next week. They usually occur around the middle of the month or so. And I alternate the time between 8 p.m. New York, so Eastern Standard Time uh, or Daylight Time for the States, and the other month, it's 8 p.m. for me here in Australia, in Melbourne. So it varies each month just to cater for different time zones. Okay, so let's get on to things today. <laughs> and I know this is the bit we're all keen to get on to. First of all, remote learning, everyone has been thrown into the deep end with this. I know a number of you are totally freaked out. Some of you are okay. A lot of you are totally freaked out by this. And the first thing I want to say is don't panic. Now, you may see a few slides if you attended my live webinar that I did a couple of weeks ago, um, which was sort of an introductory general session. Uh, you might see some familiar slides in here, but this is Max the monkey. I've named him Max, and you might see him pop up in today's session a bit. But don't panic. There are a lot of things you can do, and the things that I think are important to remember is that your you as a teacher have your own set of superpowers, which are that you know your content and you know how to teach and you're awesome. So don't forget those things as you're going through. I know that this is all really different and a little bit scary, but those three things uh, should get you through. Now, about this session, the things that I want to talk about today, I'm going to cover running a live online rehearsal. Yes, we're going to talk about virtual choirs, everyone's favourite topic at the moment, or bands or orchestras, whichever. I want to talk a little bit about asynchronous teaching and learning, which I think is a very underrated area. And I'm going to talk about some suggested activities and ways that you can assign them to your students. So let's get started. Let's talk first of all about teaching ensembles online. Now, this is a really hard thing. You cannot run a regular rehearsal like you always have been doing in an online format. You need to rethink things somewhat. So things are going to be different to normal. You do need to be open and adaptable and flexible. And it's important to consider the challenges that students are facing themselves at home. So ev even if you do want your whole band to log on to a live session at 10 a.m. on a Wednesday morning, some of your students may actually be sharing a single device with four siblings and one of the other three siblings needs to use the device at that time. Some may not have ready internet access all the time and there are many other challenges that students are facing. I'm going to go a little bit more into those soon and talk about some of the ways that you might overcome them, but that's just something to bear in mind. So a few general tips. With approaching anything that we're going to talk about today, I think it's really best for you to consider starting with the basic or easy tech options. And by basic and easy, I mean what's what's basic and easy for you personally. If you're super comfortable with tech and you've been doing a lot of things for many years, uh, starting off maybe in a different place, you might be starting off in a different place to someone who's totally new to working in an online format. I think it's important to avoid stress for yourself and for your students at this time and not take on too many new things. So new things might be new things to you personally and might also be new things to your students. And if your students are getting new things from lots of different teachers at once and the whole online learning format is new to them, that can be quite stressful. I know it's also causing teachers a lot of stress too. So I think it's really good to start small, keep it very simple and focus on the music and the learning outcomes. Okay, so live synchronous rehearsals. Let's talk about this because I know this is the first thing everyone wants to do and it looks like when you look at things online, it looks like that there are a lot of people doing, doing this thing where they are performing live, everyone in their own homes. And I know lots of you are dreaming of running a live rehearsals, a live rehearsal with your 50 students on a video conferencing call. Now, I'm pretty sure most of you know by now that you need to let it go because it's just not going to happen. So I'm pretty sure most of you have either explored this, you may have tried it, you might have seen videos floating around of people attempting to do it. 
it's not going to happen. You cannot have your whole band on or your whole choir on and everybody sing along together or play along together the way that you would in a room. So the live rehearsals aren't possible and this is due largely to the latency or lag that happens between everybody that's online. Um, I forgot to put it in my slides, but there was a fantastic reply to this question in one of the Facebook groups. I mean, I think it was the Australian Classroom Music Teachers Group. Someone actually wrote out the technical details of why this doesn't work, um, including all the information about uh, data going up and down and internet packets and all this sort of stuff. It was such a fabulous reply. and It's just not possible. And I find that when people get told it's not possible, with say Zoom, they say, well, what is the app that will make this work? There is no magic app. None of them will do this for you. Um, there are varying internet speeds at everyone's different houses. There are many other technical reasons why this won't work. So just need to think of alternative things to do and not get caught up with wanting to do this live synchronous rehearsal. So Instead, I think it's really good to look at what is possible rather than sort of focusing on what you can't do because we're in this online format. Uh, the main option here, if you do want to have your whole band or ensemble on and do something together, is to do a silent rehearsal. And I'll describe that process in a moment. But it's also important to remember the importance of social connection. So even though you cannot play live and everybody hears each other, it is really good to still be able to connect with everyone on a call together. So I'm going to talk about the tech options for what you can use and I'm going to talk about some ways that you can approach this or structure your rehearsals if you do want to do some kind of rehearsing online. So main tech options for doing live video conference calls with a group of people and I've, I've just got three main ones here. There are many other other options out there. But the main ones that most schools are using at the moment are Zoom, Google Hangouts Meet. I'm just going to call that Google Meet from this point forward. Microsoft Teams is another one. And some people are using things like WebEx and some of those other systems that have been around for a long time. Now, you're probably going to have to use whatever your school or district recommends that you use. You may not get a choice. If you do get a choice, and you are wanting to do this kind of group music uh, rehearsal in some kind of format, Zoom has the most options for you and the most flexibility and the most features that will make this work better for you. Now, I can hear lots of you thinking, but hang on, Zoom's got all these issues at the moment and some of you actually may not be able to use Zoom because your school may not let you. So some schools and districts are saying um, this is the one and only platform we are allowing you to use. You may not get an option. If you are using Zoom or if you would like to consider using Zoom but you're a little bit worried, there have been a lot of news reports going around lately, articles, uh, TV, um, what do you call it, news pieces on Zoom and the privacy concerns, security issues, this issue of Zoom raiders or Zoom bombing where people come into your call who are not invited. And I just want to say that Zoom has actually worked really hard and have fixed a lot of these issues. So if you find an article, please check the date of that article. It is probably old news by now. And by old news, I mean even last week is old news. Zoom has worked every day to fix a lot of these issues up. And the main thing that I see being done, done wrong is that the person hosting the meeting, you actually are the one that controls your meeting settings. And a lot of the issues occur because the meeting has not been set up correctly. So I'm going to just run through briefly for those of you who are using Zoom or who want to, here are the things that you need to consider. And as I mentioned earlier, you'll get a copy of these slides. So you'll have a list of these things that you can just uh, refer to later if you want to. First thing is to use the latest version. If you have Zoom downloaded to your laptop, check for updates. You want to make sure you're on the latest version. Other things that you can do to secure your meetings are to use meeting passwords and the waiting room feature. Now, Zoom actually announced over the weekend that those things are turned on by default for 
many types of accounts. There are some types of accounts I think it is not turned on for, but generally speaking, those options, especially if you've got an education account signed up through your school, those things will be turned on by default. So this means when people join your meeting, they have to enter a password to get in there. And the waiting room feature is a fantastic one anyway. So this is something that if it is not on by default, you can actually turn on as a meeting host. You set up your meeting, you say, yes, I want to enable the waiting room feature. And what this means is that when people start logging into your Zoom call, they actually are not admitted to the call. You can see them there as the host. They're kind of in a a holding area and you can see them there but they are not actually in your call until you click the button to admit them into the call. So this is great. You can do a little check of the names in the list and if there's someone you don't recognise, then you can just leave them out of the meeting. The only issue I can see with that is that some kids may log in with a different name on the screen. If you're logged in as your parent, um, you may need to just double check that. But just something to be aware of, you can admit people as you choose. Other things, um, and again, some of these things Zoom has now turned off by default anyway, but you want to make sure that screen sharing as an option is off for participants. It's on for you, but off for participants. Another thing you can do is to lock the meeting after it started. So once you can see your class has come in, you can then lock the meeting and no one else can get into that meeting after it started. That may also encourage kids to arrive on time because they know they will be locked out at a certain point if you choose to implement that one. And the last thing is to check the file transfer option. So there is an option in the chat window for for participants, if you have this turned on, to send a file into the chat. This is where some, again, some things have been going wrong. So you can again turn that off if it's not already turned off in your account. So I hope those things will help you and make things a bit more secure for you. Um, And all of those features, um, I'm not gonna show screenshots of Zoom today, but all of those features, once you're in your meeting, if you just click around the screen on the different options, you'll be able to see them there. And I will say, that if you can't see, for instance, the waiting room feature or the breakout room feature, sometimes you need to go back to the uh, the web portal. So if you go to the Zoom website and log in there, there are some sort of uh, overarching account features that you can turn on and off. And sometimes if you can't see a button when you're in the meeting room itself, you just need to enable it in your overarching account on the Zoom website. It's really worth uh, before one of your meetings or calls just to go there, check through all the options, make sure everything's set up how you want it to be. Okay, so for those of you using Google Meet, uh, one of the things that people don't love about Google Meet is that you can't see everyone in that Brady Bunch style grid. You can only see sort of like three people at once or so. There is actually an extension that you can download and install that will allow you to see a similar view to what you can see in Zoom. So it's called the Grid View extension and that will allow you to see lots and lots of kids on the screen at once. I won't say all of them because it really depends how many you have in your meeting call, uh, but do check that out. Now, there are few fewer audio options to turn on or off or adjust in Google Meet, which is why... Out of uh, the three main ones that I'm talking about today, Zoom is the better one because it does have these other features, which I'll talk about in a second. Now, Microsoft Teams, similarly, does not have that grid view or gallery view. You can only see up to four people at once. I think out of the three, this is possibly um, the least useful for this type of situation with a large ensemble altogether on screen. Um, And again, there are fewer audio settings. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the approach to running rehearsals in this way. And I've just realised I may not have included the Zoom settings. Maybe I'll have them later on. (laughs) Let me just see. Okay, so if you are considering running a rehearsal in this way, the approach that most people are taking is to run a silent rehearsal. So what this means is that you as a conductor are unmuted You can talk, you can sing, you can play, you can play your keyboard if you have one handy, you can play your instrument and you can also play a backing track or accompaniment track of some sort from your laptop and everyone can hear it. 
Now, at the same time as you doing that, all of the students are actually muted. They cannot be heard by you or by each other. And what this means is that you can lead them in a rehearsal just like you would if you were there in person and you can get them to sing along or play along with whatever it is that you're doing and they will have an experience of rehearsing the piece of music. Now, no, it is not the same as when you're in person in the same room as each other. And I have to say as a conductor, because I tried this uh, with my choir last week, I think it was, only last week, um, I've been talking about doing this and then I actually had a try at doing it and I'm going to say it's a weird experience. It is a weird experience. It's not the same because you cannot hear the feedback that you're used to. You don't get that musical feedback straight away and you cannot identify, oh, they really need help with that section there or they just don't get that rhythm. It's super hard. Now, my friend Anna, who runs multiple choirs in Sydney here in Australia, um, and my choir is actually one of her choirs, uh, she has been doing these Zoom rehearsals for quite some time now. Well, actually, it's only been maybe two or three weeks, but she's done a lot of them in that time. And she says or describes it as, uh, as if you are a TV presenter in a young kids show. So if you can picture how in young children's shows they they kind of talk to the screen and they talk to the kids as if they know what the kids are doing at the other side like she describes it as running the rehearsal and saying, "Yep, that sounded great, but I think maybe we just need to do this little bit again because it sounded like you weren't quite confident there." She literally says that during her Zoom rehearsals not having heard anything from any of the choir members because they're all muted. But as a conductor, and we're all probably the same in this, we all know the bits that are not going to be done well. <laughs> we all know the bits that are going to go wrong. Or if you have been working on this piece with your kids when you were in person, you probably already know what they were having trouble with. So she runs it in that way. She pretends like she's a, a presenter on a TV show for young children. So uh, some things you can do uh, are, which are quite useful. One thing is, for instance, you if you particularly if you're in a choir, you can sing a round. So um, I did this with my choir. I sang a round, just me on my own, one part, and I asked the choir members to sing. You know, coming in after me, I brought in each voice as I would expect it to be coming in. Now I can see on the screen all the different windows and I can see people's mouths moving and I can see that they are actually singing along. So you do get some visual feedback. While you're running this rehearsal in this way, you can get the choir members or ensemble members to use the reaction button. So Zoom, for instance, has little buttons where there's like a raise hand or a yes or a no, and they can just click a button to indicate whether they are okay with this section or need help on this section or want to do, you know, if you say, do you want to do that bit again, they can do uh, like a thumbs up to you. Um, that's really good. I found that if you have a smaller group of people and all of their videos fit onto the one screen and you can see everybody, it can be easier to just get them to physically do a thumbs up in the video camera or thumbs down. That does not work, though, if you've got a very large ensemble and you can't see everyone on the screen at once. So you've got to sort of uh, work out what's going to be best. You can also have the chat window going and just ask people to comment in the chat window, do we need help on this section? What's the bit that you need a bit more help with? And again, I will just mention this social connection is so important. So even though you're not getting all of the benefit of singing together as an ensemble, there are still lots of benefits that you can get out of it. The ensemble can still see what your intentions are as a conductor. They can still see how you want the piece to go, what tempo you want, what sort of feeling you want in different sections. All of that can still be imparted by you during a rehearsal like this, even though you're not getting that audio feedback. Now, I just want to give a quick shout out to Michelle Rose. Now, she um, she was the first one really I heard about doing this in great detail and she's a member of the Music Educators Creating Online Learning Facebook group and in that Facebook group she described this process really well and she has actually been teaching in a virtual way even before coronavirus. She actually does this. This is how she works and she's been doing it for, for a long time. So she has some great techniques down. 
If you join that group or you're already a member of that group, you can go back, search for her name and you can go back and watch some mock rehearsals that she did with members of that group. So she said to the members, do you want to come and join in a mock rehearsal and I'll show you how I run my choir, my band, my my orchestra sessions. So if you go back and look, you'll be able to get the experience of how she runs those. Okay, so a few ideas and um, some of these do come from my lovely friend Anna who runs the choir. She shared a post in a choir group that we're both a member of about um, what sort of things you can do while you're on a Zoom call in your rehearsal. Now, some people are doing the warm-up section of the rehearsal unmuted. It's going to sound like a cacophony of sound. Everyone will be out of time, but maybe that doesn't matter just for the warm-ups. Do some scales, do a few drills. If you're singing, you know, you can do your singing warm-ups. That can be okay. Leave everyone unmuted, let them have a bit of fun and then mute them after that. One thing that can be nice to do is that you as the host can play some music and you can do this by sharing your computer audio so that it actually sounds quite good at the end of the other people for the participants. Um, and this is in Zoom. Unfortunately, I don't think you can do this in Google Meet or Microsoft Teams, but you can share some audio and just do a physical warm-up, a dance party warm-up. Pick one track and everyone dances along in front of the camera, mucks around, has a bit of fun. I mentioned singing or playing around. As a, a conductor, you can do that. You can play or sing one part and everyone else can play and sing along with you. Using the breakout rooms, if you are using Zoom, there's an option to have breakout rooms in your session. So if you do have a large group, let's say you've got 50 or 100 people in your session, you can actually split that group up into as many subgroups as you like and that small subgroup of people can work together. And this can be really useful for sectional rehearsals. So um, Anna was saying that what she has done with the choirs, because her a couple of her choirs are very large, and what she did was actually to uh, organise for a section leader or a facilitator for each of the breakout rooms. She provided a pre-recorded video of her that the facilitator or section leader played in the breakout room for that small group to work with while Anna herself ran another sectional rehearsal or Anna went around and popped into each of the breakout rooms to check up on them. Some people are also using the breakout rooms um, in terms of sending small groups off to simply socialise with one another and chat while one small group is being worked with in a musical way. So another option there. I mentioned uh, already providing pre-recorded teaching video or it could be an audio track for the breakout rooms to work with. And another idea uh, for any of the systems that you're using is that you can share your screen which could have a score on it in order to discuss the score and talk about any difficult parts maybe that the students are working on. So you can share the score and talk through some of the options there. So that's just a few ideas for what you might do in the rehearsal itself. Now, you might be wondering how on earth do you end up hearing anything that the students are doing because at some point you really kind of need to hear what they're doing and how they're going. Now, I think the best approach to this is more of that asynchronous approach where students are going to then send you, if they can, send you a video or an audio recording of their part. Now, there are many ways to do this. They can simply record themselves on their phone. I'm going to say uh, that if you're using Smart Music or Practice First, which are both uh, online learning tools for ensembles, which allow students to view a score, to hear the score played back, and also to record themselves playing parts of that score, that's got its own inbuilt audio recording facility and students can record within that if you're using it. Both of those have free free trials or extended trials or premium features for free. I can't remember which one it is at the moment. So um, do go and check those out if you're not already using them and you want to explore that. If you want students just to record audio 
just the audio portion, you can use a digital audio workstation, DAW, door, and they can do that. They can hit record and record their part. So a digital audio workstation is the generic term for programs like GarageBand or Soundtrap or BandLab or Logic Pro or Pro Tools or Mixcraft or any of the other 6 million options out there. It doesn't matter which one they use any of those will be really great. They can hit record, record their part, and then send it to you. And lastly, if you want to do video with the kids, if you want to get them to submit playing assessments for you, I can't tell you enough how easy Flipgrid makes this. Now, Flipgrid, I'll talk a little bit more about in a second, but Flipgrid is a free tool and it's a video response tool. So you as a teacher can set up a topic you can record your own video explaining something to students and then you can get them to submit videos back to you really, really easily. If you're wanting to get multiple students submitting videos to you, this is by far the best and the easiest option. And if there was one tool or two tools that you were going to learn that are new to you, this could be possibly one of the ones I would suggest is worth using. It just makes it much easier it means that kids don't have to record something on their phone, then export it or download it and then upload it somewhere else. It really eliminates all of those um, fiddly, fiddly things. And for you as a teacher too, it, it just makes it a lot easier. It all ends up in one place. They can record into Flipgrid directly from their phone or iPad or laptop or Chromebook or whatever it is that they're using. Okay, so... Let's just talk about backing tracks for a minute. So, you know, with students working, if they're working by themselves and they want to play a part or sing a part and you maybe want them to record themselves over the top of a backing, you might be wondering, well, where do they get these backing tracks from? And there are, again, a number of options. Do you love this picture of the gramophone, by the way? <laughs> I really wanted to use it somewhere and I thought this was the ideal place. Uh, so backing tracks, again, if you're using Smart Music or Practice First, once you're viewing a score in Smart Music or Practice First, uh, the score can play back. So you kind of have this backing track in there already. Uh, some of the ones there are MIDI, so they don't sound like real instruments or they, they sort of do. Uh, and some of them are audio backing tracks where there's actual live people who have recorded themselves. Then second, uh, second option is that the publisher may have backing tracks already that you can purchase along with the sheet music. So there may be ones that are, are there already. If you yourself have arranged or composed the piece of music that your students are playing and you did it in notation software like Sibelius or Finale or Dorico or Noteflight or MuseScore, you can actually generate really easily a backing track from that score. You just export your score as an audio file and any parts that you have muted will be muted in the backing track that you export. So I used to use this all the time for an a cappella group that I was in. I would export um, five different versions of each score, audio score. I would do each one with the one with the soprano one muted, one with the soprano two muted, but all the other parts playing, one with the tenor part muted, but all the other parts playing. I'd make these karaoke kind of versions for us all and that was our practice tracks, really easy to do. And then the last option for backing tracks really is um, that's recorded by you or you and your friends <laughs> where you, you sit there and you record each of the parts. Um, that's uh, not so bad if you're working with a three or four part choir. That's very tedious if you're working with a large ensemble like an orchestra or a band may not be an option for you. So um, just see what works um, and, and use whatever you can that's already created. If you are going to go down the track of recording backing tracks yourself, you will most likely, or my recommendation is that you use a digital audio workstation like we talked about earlier. So any one of those options. And you can record audio as in yourself in front of a microphone playing or singing. Or you can actually use MIDI, which is essentially using the software instrument inside the, the software that you're using. I do want to mention this because if you're not a keyboard player and you need to record a keyboard part, if you use, let's say, GarageBand's inbuilt keyboard instrument, so you bring up the software instrument on the screen and it's a keyboard, you can play 
just the right hand on its own and then you can record just the left hand on its own. You can also record them at half the tempo and then once you finish recording, you can speed them up again to the correct tempo. MIDI can be so useful like that. There's no loss of quality when you do that. It's a great way to record parts, um, particularly if you don't play the instrument. It also opens up instrument sound options. I, for instance, am not a trumpeter, nor do I have a trumpet, but I could bring up a trumpet in any of those software programs and play a part in. It's not going to sound like a professional trumpeter, but it's going to be better than nothing and it will be a great backing track still. If you've never used a digital audio workstation, and I know that there are some of you out there who haven't, um, this is kind of what they look like. That's um, GarageBand at the top left there, Soundtrap at the bottom right, but it really does not matter which one you're using. They all work in a very similar way. So you can see each of those lines there is a different instrument in the track and you record the part on the track. Okay, let's just briefly talk about optimising your sound in, I did include these slides, I thought I did, <laughs> optimising your sound in these confer video conferencing software programs. So some general tips. Look, these, these programs were designed for normal, regular corporate style meetings. They were not designed for music ensemble get-togethers at all. And what that means is that they try to suppress the background noise, i.e., um, let's say I've got someone in my corporate meeting who's clacking away on their computer keyboard because they're taking meeting notes. The software will try to suppress that background noise and just pick up voices. So that's awesome if you're in these corporate meetings. It's not so good for an ensemble because it might actually cut out some of the sound that you do want to have in your your headphones or in the microphone. It will also automatically adjust the volume. So it kind of tries to compensate for low sound and high sound and so on. I'm just going to talk about some Zoom settings uh, because really the other programs don't have settings <laughs> much that you can fiddle with. I'm going to do these quickly because you're going to get a copy of the slides and I want to make sure I get onto other things. So the first thing in Zoom, there's four things that are important to adjust in the Zoom settings if you're using Zoom. One is that you go into your audio settings and you turn off this option to automatically adjust microphone volume. That will mean that it doesn't um, go up and down the, the input of the microphone. The second thing is in the advanced settings, and this is still under audio, there are two options which suppress background noise and you need to go in there and disable those. I think by default they're on auto, but I've gone in and made mine say disable. Now, the third thing you're going to do is in that same area in the advanced settings is to turn on the option to show enable original sound. So what you're doing here is turning on a button that's going to show when you're in your meeting. I'll show you what this looks like on the next screen. Once you're in your Zoom meeting, it looks like this. And if you've turned that option on, you'll see in the top left-hand corner, there's a button to do with original sound. And what you want to do is turn on original sound. And that's especially when you're singing or playing yourself. That will preserve the original sound that's going into the microphone. And it kind of avoids that ducking thing that happens where um, sound cuts in and out as different people are talking and singing and so on. So preserve the original sound. You want to make sure that's turned on. I hope those are helpful tips. So if you're using Zoom, um, hopefully you've made some of those adjustments already. Or if you haven't already, um, they may improve things for you. I'm currently working on a Zoom guide for music teachers. It was going to be a simple one-page thing, but it's blown out to be a little bit more than that now. I, ha I really wanted to have it done by the time of this webinar today. It's not quite there yet, but hopefully by the end of the week. So look out for that. If you're on the mailing list, um, you will see that come through. Okay. Let's talk about virtual choirs, everyone's favourite. Virtual choirs or I'm going to say band or orchestra, it doesn't matter what, what you're doing, whatever your ensemble is. Now, you, <laughs> this has been like one of 
it, it's been a little bit funny, the topic of this, um, because it's been coming up so many times in all of the Facebook groups I'm in. Every day someone else asks the question, hey, what's the app that I can do to make a virtual choir? Um, and so consequently, there are a number of memes running around, um, including these two, which are about making virtual choirs. Um, and the other thing is I ended up writing an article because I had seen the question pop up so often that a couple of weeks ago I wrote this article called Dear Music Teachers, Please Stop Asking How to Create a Virtual Choir Video. Now, I purposefully made the heading a little bit controversial if you read the article, you'll know that I don't actually say don't do it. I actually am warning you how much work is involved. So the whole point of the article was to just point out these are all the things involved. It's really not easy. And I, I, I get a bit annoyed by the ones that are floating around that are fabulous and they are fabulous. Like, don't get me wrong. I love this as a project. I think it's a fantastic project to do. I'm just not convinced it's the best use of everyone's time right now. If you're already stressed out about teaching online and you're already learning lots of new um, online platforms and teaching options and just working out how on earth to run your classes, this may not be the best use of time. But if you are in the place where you do have time on your hands, by all means, go for it. Like that, that is totally fine. It's not. I'm not saying don't do it. I just wanted to offer, you know, lots of options and tell you what is involved. And I'm going to run through what is involved right now because I hear this a lot, but I really, really, really want to do it anyway. Even though you're telling me it's a big thing, I really want to do it. So I'm going to talk you through the options as I see them. And there are many ways you can approach this project, but I'll give you the broad brush strokes of how you actually get this going. So the things I want to tell you first is that, yes, it's a lot of work. And by a lot of work, um, the, the people who are doing this project, at a minimum, we're looking at six to eight hours. And I would think that's a very conservative minimum. And I would say that they're doing it in a, um, a quicker way. So you may not get the polished result that you see on a lot of the virtual choirs online. So be prepared. If you have a spare eight hours, go for it. So the question is, do you have the time and the tech skills involved? Can you get help? So if you've got someone who's a really good video editor and or audio editor, maybe this is a good project for you to consider. And what are the learning outcomes? I think you always kind of need to bring it back to that. If the point of doing this is because uh, you want to provide a musical experience for the students. There are some things that they will get out of this project, but there's a lot of time spent on it that don't that, that does not benefit the students themselves, if you know what I mean. So I'm going to run through how this works, and uh, then you can make that decision about what what you want to do afterwards. So first of all, the first question everybody asks is, which app do I do? What's the magic app that will make this work? And there is no one magic app. There's one that kind of does things like this in a slightly easier way, but it's not the, the, the only solution and it's not the best solution either. The main thing is that the people who are doing these videos are using two things. They're using a digital audio workstation to record and process the audio portion. And then they are using video editing software to put together the video portion and add in the audio portion and synchronize the two together. So I've put some suggestions on there of what uh, those software programs could be. They are not the only ones and it honestly doesn't matter which one you use. They all do similar things. Um, in terms of the video editing, which is the area that people are less familiar with, uh, Adobe Premiere or Final Cut Pro are the more pro options for this. Wii Video and iMovie um, both can probably handle some kind of version of this project. Uh, if you've never done video editing before, it's going to be a, a bigger leap. It's going to be a steeper learning curve. So let's look at the 
the kind of the workflow here. So on the left hand side, these are the things that you or whoever is organizing your virtual choir video for you. These are the things that you're going to do. And on the right hand side is what the ensemble members are going to do. So you start off by creating some kind of guide tracks. You need that because you're going to need to send something to your ensemble members to sing or play along with. Sometimes also there may be a conductor video which is silent and just shows you as a conductor on the screen. That's how Eric Whitaker with the virtual choir videos um, does it. He sends out a guide backing track for people to sing along with and also a conductor video that they watch while they're recording their part. So those get sent off to the ensemble members, they rehearse their parts, they record their audio. Now this is just one of the options here, doing the audio and video separately, but they record the audio, making sure that they've got headphones on because if you don't, the sound of the backing track comes out while you're recording in your voice or your instrument. So you have headphones on, record the audio, they then send the audio file back to you, you then edit the audio tracks, you're going to need to cut off the beginning part, you're going to need to maybe cut off the end part, you need to synchronise all the audio tracks together. If you've got 50 in your ensemble or 70, there are 70 audio tracks to do, then you're going to put them all into one master file and send that back to the performers and then they can use that to record their video and they actually do this bit, uh, they actually they don't really mime along. You can actually play along and record the video, but the audio part that gets recorded at that point doesn't get used. So you play along, you mime to the video, uh, the audio track that's been made, and then they export the video, send it back to you, and then all the videos get edited and synced together to the master track that you made with the audio file. Phew. Okay, so that's one version. <laughs> the slightly quicker version, so this is a second one, is to do virtually the same sort of thing up until the point where this is my idea. Now, I have not tried this and this is just my idea to uh, make the video portion a little bit quicker. You could do the same sort of thing. You get all the audio tracks together, you end up with a master audio file, send that back to the performers and, and for them to just have a practice with. But instead of getting them to record individual videos, you could actually get them onto a Zoom call, a group one, and they can mime along while they're all muted in your Zoom call and that is recorded. So you as a conductor just hit record on your Zoom call and instantly you get all the videos on the screen simultaneously. If you've got a large ensemble, you'll need to scroll through the different screens showing your different students because you can only have a maximum of, I think, 49 on one screen at a time. So if you've got 100, you'll need to scroll through and then back and forth and so on. I don't know. What do you think about that one? That could speed things up just a little bit. Another quick option, not really quick. <laughs> Again, create the guide tracks, create the video if you want to do that as well. They rehearse with them and then they just record a video and the audio all at once, send that video file to you and you synchronise all of those. So that one will give you, um, it, it's a slightly quicker process in a way because you're not doing audio and video separately, but the quality won't be as good as if you process those two things separately. And I'm going to talk about one last option here, which is using the Archipelago app. Now, lots of people have suggested this, hey, it's a great app, and there are lots of good things about it. It kind of does this sort of thing for you without you having to do a lot of it manually. It's got the, um, basically you can record your own videos into each square on the screen and you can basically do this sort of multi-track video a little bit more easier, easier, easier than if you were doing a manual version that I've just described. Now, I need to let you know about the limitations of using this app and uh, one thing is that you can only have nine videos in total. So if you've got an ensemble of 50, this is not going to be an option for you. But the second point there on the screen about the age restrictions, I think this is even more important to check. Now, uh, the Acapella app has in its terms and conditions that you need to be 13 or older to use it. And that's because it's, it's set up like a social media sharing kind of app. 
Having said that, there are also some extra limitations to do with age involved depending on where you live. So I was um, having a conversation in a Facebook group about someone who signed up and he couldn't sign his daughter up, who was 15, I think, because it was saying that she needed to be 16 or older. So depending on location, it may not be a 13-year-old limit. It may be older than that. So this app's really only going to be suitable if you're working with senior age students. So year 10, 11, 12, I'm going to suggest. And it could be a great option for them if you do want them to have a go, working in as individuals to make multiple tracks of this, the same song themselves or even working in small groups together. The free version of this app also has some limitations. One is that it has a one minute time length in the free version. So you can only record one minute of music. Not so bad. You could just get kids to do a verse and a chorus or the first section of a piece of music. So that could be okay. You can upgrade your app to get access to longer pieces of music. And also upgrading will give you better video and better audio quality. The other thing is you need to plan your project really carefully before you hit the record button because you need to decide ahead of time how many squares you want on your screen, i.e. how many musical parts you're going to record. And also you need to decide how long it is that you're going to record for. If you've got the upgraded version, you can record for 15 seconds, 30 seconds, one minute, uh, three minutes, 10 minutes, something like that. If you decide you're going to do a three-minute piece and, in fact, your piece ends up being three and a half minutes, the app will cut off at the three-minute point if that's what you chose at the beginning. So it's not the end of the world. you just got to plan. And the last thing I'll say about this app is that it only works on iOS. Now, yes, there is kind of an Android version available in the store, but they have not updated it to, since 2016 and the developers themselves have said that is because they cannot get it to work well on Android. It's to do with the way Android hardware is built. It's just not a thing. So this is only good if your students or you have iOS devices. So that's everything about the Acapella app that I can tell you. There are some great videos on YouTube. There's a, a YouTube user called um, Gina Luciani, and she has just released, literally on the weekend, some updated apps walking you through how to use it. So if you're interested, definitely go and check those out. Okay, let's talk about asynchronous teaching. So this is the bit that I think uh, maybe more people should consider because the live rehearsing thing, you know, it's tough and it's not going to be the same experience. So asynchronous teaching or learning versus synchronous learning, obviously this is where you're setting tasks for students ahead of time, they are completing tasks in their own time and they send something back to you. It's You are not online at the same time, you're not teaching them in the same room at the same time at 10am on a Tuesday, you're working kind of separately and independently but still connecting with each other asynchronously. Now, the reason that this is so useful is that it offers a lot of flexibility and the issues that are there with synchronous learning, i.e. those things that I talked about earlier, if a student is in a household where there's only a single device and there are five people who need to use it, logging online at a certain time of day is going to be difficult for them. There are some places where internet is an issue, just internet access generally. Uh, there are some households, particularly with young students, where you might need the adult to be present in a live teaching session in order to help that student out. And if the adult is still going to work, um, there might be times of the day where the student just can't have the adult present at the time you're online. I do still think it's important to have some kind of live sessions where People can connect with one another. Students can connect with you or with each other. Um, but you might consider using those instead as a just a check-in session, a Q&A session, a little bit of teaching, explaining something that the students didn't understand. So with asynchronous teaching, the kind of the thing that you'll do is maybe make teaching resources. So that might be making teaching videos. You might be preparing handouts or digital resources ahead of time. You upload them and share them with students. 
and then they will complete the task. Now, you can also record feedback. So if you do want to give verbal feedback or on a video, you can record yourself doing that. That can work really, really well. And that video conference you can save, as mentioned, for a live Q&A or discussion sort of time. So if you're considering asynchronous options, it's really good to provide some activities that work offline and some that maybe are online. And for those reasons that I mentioned earlier, internet being an issue or devices being an issue, it's really good to have a variety of options for the students. I think it's important perhaps at this time to focus on reinforcement or practice of things you've already taught students. It's going to be harder to teach them new concepts or new things focus on those reinforcing and practicing um, options instead. Providing a, a choice of activities, I'm going to talk about that in a moment and show you some options for that. I think there's a lot of great ways you can provide a choice of activities to students all at once. And I'm going to say, if you are thinking, oh my gosh, this is overwhelming, if I'm going to do, you know, this thing where I'm providing teaching materials, how on earth am I going to create all of that in readiness for my class on Monday? I think it's perfectly fine and advisable to look at times for ready-made content. There are so many things out there that are ready-made that you can use, you can curate, you can pick and choose things that are good educational value videos or handouts or downloads, things from Teachers Pay Teachers. There are so many great things out there and lots of teachers are sharing things in the Facebook groups I'm in. You don't need to reinvent the wheel all the time. The people who are sharing materials in Facebook groups at the moment want you to take advantage of them. Lots of people are providing files that you can copy and adjust for your own classes. I think it's a great approach to take. Don't start from scratch if you don't need to. Let's just talk briefly about teaching videos. So in terms of teaching videos, there are a, top, a few types of teaching videos that you can actually make to help your students out. So there might be this sort where it's face to camera. So you're in front of the camera and you're playing or you're singing or you're speaking to your students. Um, I pinched this screenshot from my friend Scott Watson, who's a teacher in the States, and he has been making some warm-up videos for band. Him and his daughter are playing warm-up videos on YouTube. Um, do go and look them up. They've got a, a first-year band warm-ups video and a second-year band warm-ups video. And so this is the sort of thing that you can easily create, you in front of the camera. Uh, this is a, a percussion duo in Australia who are fantastic. And again, face to camera. They are in front of the camera. They're doing rhythms with sticks and it's to, they just have a fantastic set of videos. So again, go and look for their stuff if you want some percussion options. Um, one of the guys from Stomp is also making a series of videos. His name's Ollie, I forget his surname. Um, I will provide links to a lot of these on that replay page. But face to camera, again, that's another type of uh, the same sort of video that you can make there. Another type of teaching video that's really useful to make is a screen sharing video. This is an example I just set up. So I am sharing a screen just like I'm sharing slides with you right now. And there's also a little picture in picture. So I'm on the screen too. So you can see my face, you can see me talking and hear my voice while I'm explaining something on the camera. I'm gonna tell you what tool I think you should use for all of these in a moment. The last one I'll just show you here is when, again, this is another one of Scott Watson's examples where they're still doing the warm-ups video, but they've got some notation showing on the screen. And this is another sort that you might consider. So what tools, like this is the question, that the big burning question, how do I make my teaching videos? Now, I'm going to highly, highly, highly recommend the top options there on the slide. So if you've, particularly if you've never made videos before, Screencastify and Loom are both Chrome extensions which are free and they will allow you to do all of these things. I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about those on the next slide, but they will allow you to record your you in front of the camera and also share your screen. I mentioned Flipgrid earlier. I did just glance across to the um, the chat window and saw someone ask about how to get students to submit videos, Flipgrid is the answer. If you can use Flipgrid, 
that is by far the easiest way to get students to submit videos to you. Again, I'll show you a picture of what Flipgrid looks like in a moment. If you wanted to do more advanced videos, you'll need pro proper, more fully fledged video editing software. So examples there might be WeVideo, iMovie, I use ScreenFlow a lot. Um, Camtasia is another option. QuickTime on your Mac, again, um, multiple options there. And I'm going to recommend if you're making teaching videos, yes, you can use your phone. Yes, you can use your iPad. You'll get, it's just going to be much easier if you use your laptop. I'm going to say that. <laughs> it's much easier if you can just use your laptop. Better workflow. You can see more things on the screen. There's more features sometimes showing in the software that you're using. I really do think it's a better option. So Screencastify and Loom, I'm going to talk through these and um, I mentioned mention at the beginning, like how long am I going to talk for today? Is it going to be forever? <laughs> Possibly. Uh, I have this section to go through and I'm going to talk through one more section, which is going to be actual activity suggestions for you. So um, with all of these webinars, I usually aim, aim for an hour or so and pretty much they're always more than an hour because I get excited about all the things I want to share with you. So I will just um, just reiterate that if you do need to leave for any reason, you can catch up on the replay on the recording of this session. So I'll just say that to you now. So um, I will keep going for the moment. So let's just talk briefly about Screencastify and Loom, and I won't read all this out to you, but these are two options that you install in Chrome, you hit the record button, choose a few settings which are very basic and the, these both allow you to record yourself in front of the camera. You can in addition or separately to that record your screen and your voice over the top or you can record all of those things at once. You can do screen narration and your face and in addition to that and some people don't realize this, there's actually an option to turn on the facility to record your tab audio. So this means you can record the audio that's coming out of a YouTube video or the audio that's coming out of the um, Chrome Music Lab or out of Incredibox or out of Beepbox or any of those music-based websites. You can turn that option on and it will record that audio and you can still narrate over the top. So brilliant options for making teaching videos. The reason I like these much better than nearly any other option uh, for at least simple videos is this last point that sharing videos when you use these two tools is really easy. Lots of people say to me, oh, I just use QuickTime or I just use my phone. Now, it's fine to use those. And if you've got a good workflow happening, great, stick with it, like don't change. But I will just say, if you're using your phone to record video, it is super easy to record the video, but then it's the next bit that's fiddly and hard work. <laughs> so you've recorded on your iPhone, then you need to get that video to somewhere where you can share it. So you can send it to your laptop, for instance. Now, once you've done that, the video file itself is really quite large. And if you then go and try to upload it to, say, Google Classroom or one of those online platforms where you're going to give it to your kids, sometimes the video file will be too large and you'll have to make it smaller by compressing it with another tool, something like Handbrake. And then you export it from Handbrake and then you try and upload it again and then Google Classroom goes, okay, yeah, that's fine, that's okay. There's a lot of steps involved and there's a lot of places for things to go wrong and get really frustrating. With Loom and Screencastify, you hit record, you do your video and you press stop. And as soon as you have pressed stop, you instantly have a link that you can share with your students. No kidding. That is as easy as it is. And if you're using one of those options and you are a little bit frustrated with how long it takes and the steps are involved, please, please, please just go and give these a go. They're free. Yeah, there's nothing to lose here. Just give it a go. So, um, and in terms of the two, look, uh, they're both equally as good as each other. Uh, I have been using Loom for a long time. That is the one that I use uh, the most. And I, I'm not kidding when I say I use it almost every day, probably multiple times every day. It is so useful. Okay, let's talk about Flipgrid because this is the one where it's really good for students submitting videos to you. 
Now, if you want your students, you've got a whole ensemble and you want them all to do a playing assessment or uh, some kind of thing that you've set them, a drill, a rhythmic task, and you want them to submit a video to you, Flipgrid is the best option. So in Flipgrid, you can see on the right-hand side of the screen here, you as a teacher set up a topic in Flipgrid. And the topic, um, as an example, might be um, record rhythmic exercise number one. That might be the topic for the day. And each of the students logs into that topic and they see that green button that you can see on the screen there. It's a plus sign. They are going to log in in whichever, whichever device they're using, phone, iPad, laptop. They click or tap on that green button. A camera pops open and it's just like them recording a selfie video for you. They're going to record their response, which could be their rhythmic drill or it could be them singing or playing, and then they hit submit. And instantly when they do that, it ends up on the grid. So this is a screenshot of one that I had set up for a free um, music tech challenge that I ran last year. And you can see that each of those little squares is the face of a teacher that has submitted a video to me. It makes it so much easier for the students and for you as a teacher because all of the videos end up in one place and nobody has to export, download, upload, compress any of those steps. It just all happens really easily. It's also free, totally free to use. And Flipgrid even announced over the, I think it was over the weekend, that not only can you do the face to camera thing, for a long time, they've had a whiteboard feature in there, but they've also now introduced screen recording as well into the app. So it kind of does all of those things. All right, enough about Flipgrid. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, I'm just glancing over to the uh, the window. A couple of questions I can see about Flipgrid. Flipgrid can do still images, Kathy. Yes. Um, so you can, uh, in that sort of like a whiteboard view, you can upload an image into there. So for instance, as a teacher, music teacher, you can upload the image of a music staff. So maybe it's a treble clef and you can even grab a pen tool and talk about how to, um, which direction stems should go up or down on the stave and how students would make that decision. You can actually talk that through and draw on the stave as you're going. Um, you can show still images if you're talking over them like I'm talking over slides. Um, anyway, yes, definitely really good. And Flipgrid videos, can they be shared to outside sources? I just saw that question too. Yes, you can. Uh, Flipgrid has multiple ways of sharing or locking down the privacy of videos. So you can have uh, things locked down totally so that nobody sees them or you can make your grid public or your topic public so that outside people can share them and view them. You can even share individual student videos. For instance, if you just want to share a student video with their parents only, you can uh, click through to the student video and grab the link to just that video and it means that the parents won't see any other kids in the class. There's um, pretty much any option or variation you can think of is built into Flipgrid already. You might need to just delve into the settings and sharing options when you look at it. Um, yeah, I'm pausing to read. I am. I won't get carried away answering all the questions about Flipgrid, but yes, they can record again if they don't like their first go. And even better than that, oh, this is so exciting, this one. When you're in the middle of recording your Flipgrid video, you can hit record and record the first bit and then press pause. And then you can take a deep breath <laughs> and get ready to record the second section. You go back to recording, you unpause your recording, do the next bit, and then hit pause again, deep breath, and then do the next section. So you don't have to do everything all three in one go. Also, if you want to, you can totally delete the first take that you did and just do it again. Um, and I think from memory, you can even delete certain sections if you did record in sections. I can't quite remember if that's true, but again, there are lots of options. All right, I'm going to move on. I'll come back to more Flipgrid questions at the end. So let's talk about activity ideas and how to deliver them. Now, the first thing I'm going to mention, and I think this is probably the thing to consider, this is the best thing to consider for everybody, and uh, this works at all age levels, in all areas, in all ensemble types or general music or studio teaching, whatever you're doing, 
choice boards or activity boards, or some people are calling them bingo boards, solve a lot of problems. So I'm going to show you some examples in a moment, but a choice board is a grid that you give to students which has different activities in each square. It looks kind of like a bingo board and each square has a different activity that students are going to complete. Now, you can use these in many, many ways. Students themselves can select which ones they're going to complete. But if you want to, you can put some parameters in place. So you can either say, hey, I want you to complete four things on this choice board by the end of the week. Or it could be, I want you to complete all of the activities in a bingo style. So in a row, horizontal, vertical or diagonal row. Or uh, what one of my own kids' uh, teachers did, um, they actually set an activity before they finished up for the term here. One of my kids had to do kind of like this, an activity board. Each of the squares was assigned a different point value depending on how involved that task was. And the students were told they needed to complete um, 80 points worth of tasks or 100 points worth of tasks or whatever it was that they said. So it, it was then up to the student. If they wanted to do a lot of quick tasks, they could, but they had to do more of them to make up the point value or they could do one or two bigger tasks. And I think my son even had parameters like you can only do a maximum of the small point tasks, a maximum of, say, two of those, and you have to do at least one of the 12-point tasks. Anyway, you can choose how this works, and um, there's many, many, many ways of doing it. Really good with these choice boards to include offline and online act options because then the kids that don't have online um, access all the time can use the offline options and maybe or maybe even do the online options when they do get online, when they do get access to their device or access to the internet. So this is an example that was shared in a Facebook group and thanks to Rachel Clackley who shared that in the Music Educators Creating Online Learning <laughs> Facebook group. <laughs> Um, this was, um, it's sort of less of a choice board or, or grid, but it's more of a practice schedule, but she's included some choices in that grid. So she's got sort of different types of categories that the students need to do each day. And within each category, there are multiple choices for the students there. So they can choose what they want to. Um, I love the options in the purple, for instance. There's a learn something new option. That's cool, you know. Use this time to get kids maybe learning something by ear or picking up a new instrument or learning a new scale. Um, so that's just one option. And, again, you'll get a copy of these slides so you can see them uh, later on if you want to read through in more detail. Here's a second option shared by Laura Hunt in that same Music Educators Creating Online Learning Facebook group. And again, there are columns with different categories in her example. So music theory options on the left-hand side, watch, listen and read, just for fun, perform and maintenance. I love the maintenance idea. Great time to get kids to learn about how to maintain their own instrument. I think it's a great option. So I'm not sure if she required them to do one from each column, but that's definitely something you could do. You say, I want you to do one from each column um, and, and check them off. So my activity ideas that can go into your choice grid or into Flipgrid or just assigned to the students as standalone activities are some things like this. You could get them to compose their own warm-ups or notate or and then notate and share them. And I'm mentioning these options because I think it's really good to consider other beneficial music education things your students can be doing at this time which don't involve one of those live synchronous rehearsals which are going to be kind of hard work. So these options are things that they can do while they're still furthering their musical education and uh, still achieving things and um, getting practice at things. They're just different to actually doing a rehearsal altogether. So transcribing a solo or some kind of piece of music, I used to do that all the time growing up. It was one of the reasons my um, oral skills developed was because I was listening to things and transcribing them all the time. It's such a great thing to do. Um, your students could learn from existing online videos and record what they learnt and actually talk about what they learnt in that online video that they watched. They could be ones that are curated by you or if you've got older students, maybe they go and find their own video.
You can get them to create a rhythmic backing and then play their instrument or sing over the top of that. Creating a rhythmic backing is super easy. There's lots of free online tools that they can uh, use to do that, like Groove Pizza. They could open up GarageBand and create something there. Many, many options. And they can do something even like teaching someone else how to assemble the instrument that they play. So they can create a video for you showing you or showing the watcher how to assemble the video or they can write those instructions down. If they can't create a video, maybe they can write it out as an assignment. Activity ideas that are more specific to the repertoire that you're doing at that moment, they could record their ensemble part over a backing track in a digital audio workstation. We talked about that earlier. They could also then learn a different part, maybe not just the part that they're playing. If they've got the sheet music access to that, they could record another part. So if they're a flute player and they usually play flute one, they could maybe go ahead and record the flute two part. They could do something a little bit different like research the composer of the piece and record a podcast about that composer or do a written report. You could teach someone on a video or in writing how to tune your instrument. Much harder in writing but there you go, there's a challenge. <laughs> You can even go on a virtual tour. There's um, ways to go on a virtual tour through Google Maps. Um, you can choose a composer's birthplace and go and explore that actual physical location. And some fun kind of activities which might be useful at this time, a rhythm challenge of some sort. You might have a sheet of rhythms and the students have to play and record those. Uh, I know some people are running a virtual talent show and this works really well with Flipgrid where the kids submit their videos for the virtual talent show to Flipgrid. Um, I've done an activity for a long time now called 12, the 12 Sound Challenge where you need to make 12 sounds out of a single object and I think if you've got an ensemble, it could be actually the, the student will use their instrument to make 12 different sounds and either record them in some way or they can write them down, like how did they make the sound, What was the, um, how would you describe the sound. Note reading at this time is a great thing to do too. Uh, things like Star Wars, the app Star Wars, which is on um, iOS devices, maybe Android too, and also free on the desktop version. Um, Using apps like that, it doesn't have to be Star Wars, but you might run some kind of competition. Um, just get some fun happening with note reading. I'm going to just run through really briefly some, and I won't explain all of these in great detail, but just to show you some of the things that I have personally on my website or that are coming up. The first two are coming this week. I have not got them ready yet, but they will be here this week. And the other ones are ones that are already available. And again, I will share the links to these um, on the replay page for this webinar. So the one that I want to get together, first of all, is I've been planning this for a little while, is a musical Olympics because I think this could work really well at this time and it's topical because it is the year of the, the Olympics even though they are unlikely to run or have they already been cancelled? I'm not even sure about that. So my idea with this is that you can set up a series of Olympic events and the kids can enter the events and you will award a bronze, silver and gold medal for each of the events. So events will include things like who can play the longest note, or who can play the fastest and most accurate performance of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star? Or who can do the same thing but play it backwards? And who can play the lowest note? Or who can play the most interesting sound from your instrument? You could say to the students they have to enter a minimum of two events or three events, whatever you choose, and they can do more. You'd give them a generous deadline and then you can award uh, bronze, silver, gold medals for it. What, tell me what you think about that idea. I'm ex super excited about this one, but <laughs> maybe it's just me. Um, so, yes, I will be getting that together this week sometime and publishing that on my blog, and uh, we'll make sure that everybody uh, knows where to find it when it's published. Um, this is another one that I've been working on too. Um, my son and I, a couple of weeks ago, were making up lyrics for the lockdown blues. And so this will be where students write lyrics in that AAB blues format. Um, and what if you're working in an ensemble situation, of course, they, you can get them to record a melody to go with the lyrics. They could record a bass line if they're a bass instrument. They could sing along with what they've recorded. Uh, you can use pre-made loops if you want to, lots of different ways that you can do that activity. 
I'm going to briefly show, I'm not going to run through all these, but I have released last week five free lesson plans, which include Beatboxer or Singer using Incredibox, a Mario style video game theme on Beatbox, creating melodic palindromes using Isle of Tune, a lesson called Better Than the Original, which is a cover song showdown using YouTube videos, and a boom snap clap lesson which uses Groove Pizza. Now, as an ensemble director, they may or may not suit you, but I think that they could be fun activities to do at this time, which will still enhance uh, music skills of your students. All right, I'm going to wind up. So a few final thoughts before we head into Q&A time, and I'll, I'll actually come back to the video so you can see and, um, and talk to me that way. But a few final thoughts. I think it's really important just to give things a go. I know that this is new. Um, personally, I get kind of nervous and scared about things when I haven't done it yet. And I know that even though it's like it's a hurdle or a barrier, once I've had a go, it's not as scary as I thought it was. Um, yes, it is scary, but just have a go because once you've done it, you kind of know then how it looks and feels and then you know what you need to do to fix or to learn or to get better at it. I'm going to say that done is better than perfect. I see a lot of discussion about people wanting to make fancy teaching videos with this, that and the other and fade-ins and fade-outs and things appearing on the screen and zooming in and out. To be honest, I wouldn't do any of it at this time. Just get the message across to the kids. They will so appreciate seeing your face and or hearing your voice. Um, I just think done is better than perfect at this time. Later on down the track, when we're all in like normal world again, you can get well stuck into making videos. It's one of my favourite things to do and um, it is a lot of fun. So keep it really simple. If you want more help after today, the Facebook group that I mentioned a few times, Music Educators Creating Online Learning, is a great place. There's another one called eLearning in Music Education. Both have been set up in the last, well, probably less than a month still now and they are awesome places to get materials from other people, to ask questions, to share ideas. I have my own Facebook page and more importantly than that, I have my Midnight Music community, which is that online professional development learning space. So I am in there. You can get personalised one-on-one -on -one help from me, ask your questions. There's a forum area. I will answer the question. I usually record a video response to a lot of the questions that I get asked because it's easier for me to do it that way. And um, there's a lot of resources in there. There's courses, there's training videos, there's um, all sorts of things. And you can get PD certificates for anything that you do inside the community. All right, so to finish up, the most important things, uh, keep students making music is probably the most important thing. Just try your best. That connection is really important at this time and, and possibly it's good to emphasise that over and above anything else really. Um, the, the pattern that I'm seeing from teachers starting to do remote learning or online re learning or teaching, whatever you want to call it, is that they start off with all of these plans to kind of replicate what they were doing in the classroom and then the second week they go, oh, I'm cutting that in half. And then the third, third week, they're like, I'm going to simplify it again. You need to change your expectation. You may not be able to assess the students the way that you did in the past or just for the moment. Um, more lenience, more grace, all of those things. And most importantly, do look after yourself. All right, I mentioned the Midnight Music community already. That's what it looks like and happy to answer questions about that uh, for anyone. And if you would like a PD certificate for today, you can go to this link. Do you like what I did there with the link? Uh, so you go to midnightmusic.com.au forward slash Corona BOC. The BOC is for Band Orchestra Choir. So Corona BOC is the bit at the end. I will also pop that link into the chat window so that you can just click on it. But if you want to write it down or visit it now, you can do. So just to reiterate, webinar replay link will be available within 24 hours. You'll get a copy of my slides. The PD certificate will also be linked on that page and I will put some other useful links on there as well. Okay, so question and answer time. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and just go back to me if I can and 
There we go. And I'll open up the chat window so I can see it properly too. There we go. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thanks for the help. <laughs> thanks, thanks for thanking me. <laughs> and thank you to Martin. I don't know what went on in the chat window because I really did not keep an eye on it <laughs> as we were going, but thank you. Farewell to guest 1337. Thank you. That's lovely. Awesome. Um, oh, yep, Ruth. Yep, I can pop that in. Oh, look, Ruth, that's going to confuse people a little bit. Um, to be honest, uh, all right, I'll, I'll, I will. I'll pop that in for you. For last week's one, actually, I don't know if I've even got that link, Ruth. That's for the PD certificate for the VMTA one. Um, Ruth, if if you are okay, send it. It's you found the email. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Bev, husband has a work conference. I have to go. Great. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, Tim. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, Maggie. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. That's lovely. <laughs> Nancy's less terrified each time she listens. Great. <laughs> That's one of the nicest compliments, actually. <laughs> uh, thanks, Serena. Thank you. Flipgrid, yeah, let's talk Flipgrid. I know there were a lot of questions in my uh, background, sort of peripheral vision. Um, yes, Adele, I think you can link through Google Classroom. Um, well, anyway, you can put any link into Google Classroom. So you can set up a Flipgrid topic and then pop that in your Google Classroom. In Flipgrid, there's also an option to grab a QR code. So if you want to put that in Google Classroom, students can then scan it with their phone if they've got a phone or an iPad. Um you can, I think, maybe, maybe, maybe embed it too, but I don't quote me on that. I might be wrong. <laughs> Great. Where's my dog, says Sue? That's a good question. I don't know. She has been really quiet. Uh, she's around somewhere. She may be in one of my boys' bedrooms sleeping on the bed. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um Amy, any questions, uh, tips about setting up special mics for teaching remotely? Um, I, yeah, I. Okay, yep, yep, yep. Um, I'm Amy. Tomorrow, if you if you want more, I'm running a session tomorrow about studio instrumental teaching, and I actually do cover it in that sec that session. Having said that, a USB mic is a very useful thing. This this one that I'm using is a USB mic. Um, but what you want for saxophone teaching is not this sort. This one is directional, so it picks up my voice only. What you would want is a an omnidirectional mic which will pick up sound all around because then you can sit it on your desk, you can play your sax and talk and it will be um, your voice and instrument will be both picked up. Can you see the one over my shoulder? Um, that one there, the blue snowball, that that is uh, one that works like that, but there are other options too. Yeah, uh, affordable mics for Mac. For Mac yeah. So um, this one here, I'm going to type microphone options, USB. This one is an ATR 2100. That's an um, Audio Technica uh, microphone. The ATR 2020 is also a good option. Um, the brand blue have the Snowball and the blue Yeti. Um, yep, the Rode is an excellent option too. Rode have fantastic options. Um, the main brands that I see people using, Rode, um, Blue and Audio-Technica, there are lots of options out there. So uh, plugging in USB is, is great and easy if you've never really used an external mic, uh, mic before. If you want to use like a regular mic, like a one with an XLR cable, a Shure SM58 or so on, you need to then have an audio interface that you'll plug in. That's the thing that plugs into your Mac and then the mic will plug into that. And I'll show one. Hold on. So this here, um, lots of people have this. It's the Focusrite um, Scarlet 2i2 audio interface. So you see you can plug the microphone in there or in there also so you can have two things plugged in at once it could be a guitar at the same time and then on the back uh, there's a spot where the USB lead comes out and that goes into your, your Mac laptop or your PC it doesn't have to be Mac um, so that just gives you a bit more flexibility but that's an extra thing to purchase but um, also useful thank you um, Flipgrid question uh, how big a video can you record in Flipgrid 
that's a good uh, question. I think it's up to five minutes. You as a teacher actually kind of set that for your students. So if you only want them to do 30 seconds, you and this is a good thing to, to bear in mind, sometimes you do not want the kid to go on for five minutes. Like <laughs> I want you to answer this in 30 seconds or I want you to play this one rhythm and it's you've got 30 seconds to do it. You actually choose that when you set your topic. So all the videos on the grid are going to be a maximum of uh, 30 seconds or a minute or one and a half minutes, whatever you choose. I think the maximum is five minutes. And believe me, I don't reckon you'd want more than five minutes anyway. If you do need kids to do something that's more involved, they could do part one and part two. So it might be two five-minute videos. Oh, Kaz, thanks. I, I'm so glad you love my musical Olympics idea. I got so excited about it when I was thinking about it, like probably three weeks ago, and I still I, I still really just want to get it done. Um, yeah, I, I'm like, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> Martin uses that too. Is that the focus, right? Yeah, I... I'm not kidding. Almost everyone I know, like a music tech person, has a Focusrite Scarlett 2i2. That's just like kind of like a standard, really useful one. And it's not that expensive. Um, Martin will tell me how much it was. I can't remember. <laughs> um, yeah, um, Flipgrid allows you to modify, cr uh, create, create gra grading criteria or a rubric. Yes, Flipgrid has so many cool things going for it. Um, we, I could do a whole session on Flipgrid, literally do a whole session on Flipgrid. Maybe I should. Uh, should I buy a Focusrite to connect to my laptop? I already have a synth, a mic, and a mixer. If you've got a mixer, the mixer's kind of going to double up on what the Focusrite would do, I would say. If the mixer's doing everything already, um, so the mixer is like a more a bigger <laughs> version of what the Focusrite will do. Robert bought one last week, $200. There you go. Thank you. I knew someone would come in with the price. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's a good idea, uh, Martin, about yep, doing performances. Please do a session on Flipgrid. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> a couple of requests for that. Yeah, okay. Look, I might consider it. To be honest, I've got this one session next week um, sort of up for grabs. I haven't decided the topic yet, so it could be a Flipgrid session. Um, yeah, okay. Music Olympics you love. Janine from Ringwood. Yeah. Um, Janine, if you're on an EduMail account, I don't know why. EduMail is randomly blocking some of my emails going out, but not all of them. Go figure. Uh, Road. Yep. USB. Yeah. So any US, so this USB mic, this, this is plugged directly into my computer. No need for an audio interface, which is why I like it. It's just simple. You plug it in and use it. Um, so you can use it if you're doing, if you're making a Flipgrid video or you're making a Screencastify or Loom video, you choose this as your input uh, instead of just going into your um, inbuilt, whatever, you know, laptop microphone flipgrid session there's big lots of votes for flipgrid session <laughs> yeah and um yeah and to be honest i think the the issue with emails as far as i know it, are you all in victoria those of you who've had issues because i think it's a victorian edgy mail thing um if you can remember to if you're signing up for another one of my webinars ever in the future try a different email address don't use your school um one katie thank you the best informative training you've attended yay thank you thank you um kat says for violin teaching what mic would you recommend blue yeti would be good yep your thing disappeared out of you i'm i'm doing a session tomorrow specifically specifically for private studio instrumental teachers. So, yeah, so that's cool. Can Flipgrid connect to Teams? Yes, Julie. Flipgrid is owned by Microsoft, so absolutely it connects to Teams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and Claire, Claire's feeling more relaxed every time she sees me too. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, great. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. You've decided my next uh, live training session topic. That's cool. Yep. Yeah, the, yep, the road. Oh, thanks, Martin. I was just going to say that we should put a link there. If, oh, good. Thanks, Emma. You found the email. Connecting to Teams, I know, right? So Microsoft um, purchased Flipgrid. Flipgrid was independent. Microsoft purchased Flipgrid and before they did that, it um, Flipgrid was paid. Like there was a free tier, but then you'd have to pay for extra features. Microsoft bought it and made it completely free, which was so awesome. 
Oh, it's happening in Queensland too, Ali, yeah. I don't know why. It's super hard for me to have any control over that. Um, the other thing you can do is try to, I don't know if you are able to, but try to whitelist my email address. You can go into your email settings and whitelist or send a request to your state. <laughs> I know this is a big ask. <laughs> and ask them to whitelist me overall. That would be cool. Yeah, edge email, yeah. Look, don't worry, all of the links to these sessions are open and free and available. I will make sure they go onto my Facebook page. So all of the replay links, I'll just post them openly on the Facebook page. The reason we get people to sign up is just so that we can keep you informed of stuff, um, not to sort of lock people out or anything like that. So these ones I'm making like totally open and available. And I the edgy mail is annoying. Yeah. Anyway, I'll stop talking about that. I know there's a lot of non Australians on as well. <laughs> yes, yes to a flip grid session. Okay, cool. Oh, Kevin, Edgy Mail's blocked music mail messages recently. Man, and it's weird. I haven't noticed a big issue um, like just recently because of these webinars. I, I don't think it was always this bad. So maybe they've changed the filters. Um, yeah. Yeah, great, Ellie. Yeah, that's what I would do to um, create a rule and nothing. Yeah, I know. Arose, I know. We have no control. Thanks, Maria. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. All right. I won't scroll all the way back through to look for missing questions. If you had a question that wasn't answered by my content or by Martin along the way, um, just feel free to type it in again. I'll stay on for a little bit longer um, until my voice starts to go funny. <laughs> uh. It's changing from edgemail to education. Oh, okay, Viv, that could be a clue, yep. Thanks, Liz. Glad you're not feeling so overwhelmed. Thanks, Chris. See you tomorrow for the studio session. Excellent. Great. Thanks, Tina. Thanks, Emma. Thank you. <laughs> um, John... Yes, Adele. I love the monkeys too. Canva, totally Canva. Every single image in today's session, apart from the screenshots, were all from Canva. I have so much fun looking for uh, images to use. Um, all of my sessions, I'm actually recycling a lot of the images all the time because I just keep, I love the ones. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, go, go look for them in there. If you search monkey, um, there's actually the monkey, there's a series of different animals all with the same facial expression. So go for that. Um, Sorry, just scrolling back up again. Is there a go-to place for school administrators to check out Flipgrid? Flipgrid is not the same as Zoom, Emily. Um, Flipgrid has a totally different purpose. So Flipgrid is asynchronous, whereas Zoom is synchronous. So Zoom, you all log on at the same time. Flipgrid is an asynchronous tool and schools love it a lot more than anything else because than Zoom, for instance, because um, it's designed for education. So just go go and check that out. I would be very surprised if there were not already other teachers at your school using Flipgrid, very surprised. I can almost guarantee that at every single school, some teacher will be using Flipgrid. It's not music specific. It's for any, any subject. Thanks, Anne. Thank you, David from Minneapolis. Great. Oh, great. That's good to know it was useful because you're in the third week. I wondered whether... You know, third week of online learning, maybe you're kind of all settled in. <laughs> I know that's not true for many people. <laughs> um, uh, Geraldine has a mixer, a mic all set up. Do you require a USB lead to laptop? Um, yeah, so the mixer would, unless it's a very, very, very old mixer, it would have a USB lead coming out of that and that's what will plug into the laptop. And... or. Um, there was a stage we went through where there was, what was it called, Firewire? Am I getting that name wrong? Total mental blank. Yes, so generally you will have a USB lead from the mixer or the audio interface coming out into your laptop and the other things plug into the into the interface or the mixer. It's pretty, it's pretty easy to do. So if it's a very old, if it's an older device, um, I'm going to just say it's probably a more recent device or hope that it's a more recent device. Usually you just plug it in and it works. Occasionally you might need to download drivers. That's not so much of a thing um, more recently. If you're on a PC, maybe. Um, 
Will I be sending PED certificates? You can go straight to the link uh, to download it uh, right now if you want to or wait for the link to the replay page and um, it will be on there. And I will also pop it in now if I can remember what I did, <laughs> what I called it. Hold on. Midnightmusic.com.au forward slash corona boc. Good grief. Corona boc. That's the link for today's PD certificate. Just scrolling back up because I think I missed a few things there. Uh, Music Olympics not available yet by the end of this week. I'm putting that deadline on myself. So uh, Ailey, who asked that question, yeah, it's not out there yet. I've just I've got it all written out. You can li like I literally have it written out, but it just needs to go into a blog post and into a downloadable format for everyone. Um, Amy, if I'm using USB mic, Rode Blue Citra, can I use my own Sony noise cancelling headphones? as the headphones have a built-in microphone. Um, I don't know if Martin wants to chime in on that. I I think yes because you, you will, well, yeah, because you will essentially choose which microphone you want to use in your settings of whatever software. So if you're using Zoom, for instance, you go into the microphone options and probably you'll see both there. You'll, you might see Sony and you might see Blue Yeti or whatever it is. And you will say, I don't want to use Sony as the microphone. I want the Blue Yeti. And that's the same in like if you're using Zoom or Screencastify, same sort of thing. Um, having said that, it's funny, but for that reason, I don't often, if I'm running a session with a microphone like this, I often don't use my headphones, which have this one, just to make doubly sure that it's being picked up <laughs> through this. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Patricia. Thanks, Carol. See you tomorrow. Repeat business is good. Jenny's asking about Flipgrid similar to style. I have no idea what style is. Um, I don't think I've seen anything quite like Flipgrid, so I might say no to that, but I don't know what style is, so I'm not sure. It's so it, – I would suggest just signing up for Flipgrid and then um, – you can submit videos on your own topics as practice just to see how it works. Uh, really good. Is the USB, um, the Rode mic, omnidirectional? Uh, I'll let Martin answer that if he's still on. <laughs> I, I don't know that one offhand, so I'm not quite sure. David, David's laughing at something, but I'm not sure what that was. <laughs> Ruth, thank you. Janine, thank you. It's omnidirectional. There you go. Thank you, Emily. Thanks, Judy. Yeah, I agree. I feel very connected to people, especially at this time, like all the Facebook groups and stuff. Like it's a, it's a very level playing field at the moment, don't you think? Oh, excellent. Kim likes the other uh, the idea for the Olympics and the talent show. Excellent. I can't claim the talent show is my own one. I saw a few other teachers mention that. I know my friend Amy Burns, who is an elementary teacher, she has been doing that with her her students. Oh, Martin says omnidirectional but super, not super omni, okay. Oh, cat! That's super interesting. I mean, I, I figured that that would be the case about Victoria being remote learning for the whole of term two. Yeah. Um. So here's my dilemma. Next week, of course, my kids will start doing remote learning. They'll actually have to get out. They're, neither of them are out of bed yet. Just saying. And it's quarter to twelve, quarter to midday. Um, they are going to be up, have to be up and online at the right time. And if I want to run live webinars, I'm just not sure how the internet's going to cope, but we'll see. Thanks, Mark. Great. Oh, good. I'm glad. That the hard thing is I find with these sessions is I want to share so much stuff and each one of the top, each one of the areas I could have talked about in much more detail, but I figure an overview maybe gives you a starting point and then you can go and explore things in more detail. Thanks, Daryl. Oh, today, yep, yeah. South Dakota. When were you supposed to finish? Was it May or June uh, there? Oh, great. I'm so glad the sessions are helping. Oh, more old school teaching, yep. Yeah. yeah, and it's new but exciting as you learn new methods. Yeah, and I, I do think it's exciting. I know it's super scary and I, oh, it's not like the, the 
the way that I would have wanted everyone to learn all these skills. But but to be honest, it, it's kind of exciting to me that everyone's being forced to learn these skills because these are all the things I wish you guys had learnt, um, to be honest, a long time ago, especially with regard to making teaching videos. That's the one that is just such a, a, a great, useful thing to do. Um, that's what I was considering making that session next week on, but I may just leave it at just Flipgrid. Um, but teaching videos generally. I will talk a bit more about teaching videos on Thursday's session or Wednesday night if you're in the States, Thursday morning here if you're in Australia. Yep, John likes the virtual talent show. Yep, you can still join uh, the webinar. I'll put the webinar links in for the next two days. So, uh, oh, Martin's grabbing the links. I can see you. Thanks, Martin. I'll leave you to do that. <laughs> Um, yeah, okay. I'm just getting back to the comments. Thank you. Lockdown blues. Yes, there's a vote for the lockdown blues. Here's the dog for anyone that wanted to see the dog. She's here. Uh, I feel like I <laughs> Martin had to pop out for tech support. I love it. I love it. This is us uh, multitasking at our best, yep. I will make sure that the – Martin, I think, is grabbing the links to the um, – oh, yeah, tomorrow's session. There it is. Great. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm catching up. The the window is scrolled out of view for a second. Uh, da -da. Yep, 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 yep. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, and Amy, look, don't, don't rush out and buy lots of gear. I would – if you've got nothing else, start with the inbuilt mic and camera on your laptop or whatever you're using. Uh, just – just try that first and then when you want to level up a bit, then get an external microphone. I did not really want to talk a lot about gear today for that reason. I think it's just useful to, to give things a go. The inbuilt options are not going to be the end of the world. They're not the best options, but they're not going to be the end of the world. Just And because you see other people using lots of fancy mics and stuff like, just don't feel like you have to do that. The dog's nudging me for pats now. Uh, okay, lots of Ethernet cables to plug in all the devices. Yeah, yep, okay. Yeah, I know that. Yes, yeah, sorry, Martin, I just realised what you're talking about. Yes, I actually may be in a different spot. I don't know, those of you who have been on my sessions before, you might notice there's a new bookcase in the background here. <laughs> we, um, we've used some of our at-home time to move furniture around. We've literally done like a three-room swap of all sorts of things. So this came out of my son's room and then something that was here went into a spare room and then three other things moved as well. So I'm loving having this bookcase here. Uh, but I may actually move into the next room, which is sort of the kitchen dining area next week, because I can be closer to the router and plug directly into the Ethernet with the Ethernet cable. And um, so you might see a different background if you come to sessions after this. Great. Yeah, Kate, you're saying the same thing. Hello, Kate. <laughs> yep, and Claire too. Great. Judith, Judith's been using Flipgrid. I knew you had. Did you see your picture on the Flipgrid that I showed? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I just love it. They can just submit a little thing out of what they've been practising or we'll a whole piece um, if you want to. And then, like Judith said, you, you can give them feedback. So in Flipgrid, um, the kids can submit a video to you. You can either give them written feedback or you can record a video back to them, which I love. I, I, I like talking through feedback rather than writing it. I think it's much nicer. Teaching videos would be good. Yeah, I know. That's, oh. Um, Marg's asking, how are online lessons useful in general situations? Do you mean general music, Marg? And if so, I am running a session on Thursday, which is specifically for general music. So for elementary and middle school, particularly general music, although it can be applied for older students too. Great. Thanks, Ali. I'm glad that you found it useful. Yep. Um, yeah, Elizabeth, I, I agree. And that's why I'm, I'm reluctant to say only use other people's content. So Elizabeth just commented about using others' videos. I agree. I, I, my feeling is that um, the way you can use other people's content is 
may be a useful thing if you're very stressed and needing to get a lot of stuff together very quickly. It could be useful to use other people's content to get you through that sort of stressful time while you're working out how to use Zoom or how to use Google Classroom because I know some people are still new to that or how to use Teams and where you communicate with students and where do you post assignments. Um, that's probably what I would do, but I'm the same. I like the way I teach things, <laughs> which is why I like running these sessions, um, rather than sending people to other videos that could be on YouTube about these same topics. I like teaching it the way I like teaching it. So, um, yeah, so I agree. But I think a, a combination of both. But if you're if you don't have a lot of time to make your own teaching videos, or that is a little bit daunting, that would be a good a good option to start with. Judy's offering a virtual pat. Thank you. And yes, Judy saw yourself on the grid. <laughs> oh yeah, and seesaw. I meant to mention seesaw really today. I'm I'm going to mention it a little bit more on Thursday because seesaw tends to be used more with the younger students. But seesaw also a great way to communicate with um, students and parents and create videos, submit videos, get student work back and stuff. Um, can you pause students' videos to give audio feedback on Flipgrid? I guess you can. And actually, Claire, now that I think about it, you could have the Flipgrid video up on your screen and actually record yourself using Loom playing the student video and giving feedback. Like you could use both. You could app smash, they would call that. <laughs> um, yeah, you could totally do that. Um, I, if you're doing it all within Flipgrid, you would hit record and make your own video. I don't know. I don't think you can play the video at the same time, although they've just introduced this screen record feature. So maybe you can now. So I don't really know the answer to that definitively. Yeah, agree, Martin. Yep, students, that's that's the thing. Students actually want to hear you and from you because they are used to the way that you teach things and I think that that's so super important. Yep. Yep, and the soundtrack videos, yes, if you want a crash course in soundtrack, get stuck in. The, there's ready-made videos for that. Quick, easy. <laughs> Janine's doomed with the PD certificate. We will work it out. Janine... Can you send an email? I'm just going to pop um, an email address in the window here, and Michelle will help you out. Just put, um, we can we can even send you a Dropbox link or something with the thing in there. Um, just pop that in, so Michelle will get that email and she will help you somehow. Um, and with your home address, maybe just check. Uh, are you, Janine, I wonder, are you at school on the school network by any chance? I don't know. Catherine's asking about which video conferencing app am I using today? Yeah, interesting that no one else has asked that yet. So uh, my setup is very unique and I would not recommend this. Uh, it's very situation specific. So this is not the thing that I would recommend for you guys at school probably. Um, I'm, I'm literally using YouTube. It's YouTube Live. It's just that I have the YouTube video embedded on a web page and I happen to have set up a chat window next to it. So the chat window is totally independent of the video and the chat window is run by um, Chat Roll. Chat Roll is the thing that I use, the service that I use for that. But having said that, um, so I'm using YouTube Live. I also use another thing and look, just shut your ears if this is too overwhelming and you don't care anyway, but <laughs> I'm using a another service called StreamYard, which allows me to schedule my video on YouTube and actually allows me to run the session. And it's super easy for me to do things like switch to my screen sharing option or switch to this, which is me plus the screen or this version of me plus the screen. And if I had another person on the call, I could even switch to side-by-side -side people so StreamYard is brilliant. It's so useful for doing this. But it's the thing, um, it's more useful for it's one to a lot of people. Uh, anyway, one to 500. I know that there was 500 on at one point, I think, or almost 500. <laughs> Lisa, I just got on the chat. Uh, were you locked out before because it reached its capacity? Maybe. Anyway, I'm glad you got on. <laughs> if you come to tomorrow or the next day's one, uh, feel free to get in early. I usually, look, here's a secret for those of you who are still on. I usually, um, well, 
to be honest, you can log into the chat window as soon as you know that where the web page link is, like to watch the session, you can log in then. You could log in if you get the link the day before. You could log in then and just leave it running all night. Um, but anyway, I it's there. You can't post any messages until I open the chat, like actually, like unlock the chat sort of thing. And I do that about fifteen minutes before the session starts or so. Great, thank you, Laura. Thank you, guest five zero zero nine. Uh, Elizabeth, if you make video submissions with a long length, there'll be so much. Yeah, exactly. I agree. Um, it's funny because people <laughs> with some of the free video recording options, they might have a limit of five minutes and people are like, oh, it's got a limit. And I'm like, that's good. That's a really good thing. Like, good. I, I, if you need to make a video which is longer, honestly, you should split it into shorter parts. Nobody wants to watch a video more than five minutes. Um, having said that, you've all been on a call now for two hours with me. But anyway, this is different. But you really, really, really want to make them short and sweet. Leave out information the kids don't need to hear. They don't need to see you logging into Google Classroom and doing everything from the start. Just cut to the point, you know, get to the, the good bit. And... Um, yeah, just really short and short and sharp is is good. It's funny, like when I go to YouTube and search for something that I need to find out, I look down, the, you all do this, I'm sure, you look down the list of videos and anything that's more than five minutes, I'm like, nope, I'm not watching that. That's eight minutes long, 12 minutes, forget it. I look for the one that's shortest and that's the one I go for first. Uh, guess 5009, it's down at the moment. I'm not sure what that was in reference to. Thanks, Frank. <laughs> nice to see that you're on. You're not so far away from me here, or at least your school is not. Yes to the Music Olympics. Excellent. Thanks, Alison. Thanks, Viv. Thanks, Amber. Thanks, Jason. Oh, locked out between <laughs> too popular. Do you want to know the funny thing, Lisa? So when I usually run these sessions, like the monthly regular ones that I do before coronavirus, there's usually maybe 40 people on, 30, 40, maybe 50 if it's a popular session. And so my chat roll account had a 50-person limit because I never needed more than that. Then I ran one of these a couple of weeks ago and it totally blew out and the chat window got filled up within about two minutes of me opening it. Like it was just crazy. So then we upgraded the account after that session and I think extended it to two maybe 100 at first and then I thought now nah, that's say 250 and then on Friday I ran another session it was like a private uh, one for music teachers in Victoria that one it, it got to the 250 capacity during the session and so Kat who works with me she um, increased the account capacity during the session to 500 <laughs> and we're still blowing out at 500 but I, I actually thought you know what I won't extend it any further because it's too hard for us to manage um, the flow of chat when there's like more than 500 is going to be crazy. So if you did get locked out and you didn't get a question answered um, just either ask now or I'll leave the chat window open for a little while and I, I may go away but come back to it and check in and answer some questions uh, but you can always email or contact me on Facebook or something <laughs> thanks Catherine oh thank you that's lovely thanks Jason yeah it is a difficult time thank you James yeah Flipgrid and Loom app smash I might have to give that a go and see if that works thanks Claire oh you're in a hotel in quarantine in Melbourne um, didn't get off a cruise ship recently or anything, did you? I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. Three sessions. Wow, you are a glutton for punishment. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, guest 2647. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Um, it's the 2i2. Uh, interface solo or 2i2, the preference. Um, each of the focus right Scarlet ones have slightly different features, slightly more, each one that you go up. I didn't need a lot of inputs, for instance. So mine is, it's the 2i2, it says it very tiny there. So it has two inputs. Um, there are some extra features if you go for the upper ones. The solo, is that the lower model? I am not sure. The 2i2 I find is kind of a good medium starting point. And if you need to plug in more instruments, you can upgrade to getting four inputs, I think. Thanks, Prudence. Is that Prudence from St Margaret's Prudence? Maybe. 
It's always hard to know when there's just the first name. Could be another prudence altogether. Yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth needs more sessions but still on overload. I know, right? Oh, man. I um, I just, you know, even me, I have to shut Facebook off uh, because I'm finding that overwhelming too. Yeah, just just got to – you've got to control the, the input of information. Oh, here's the dog. She's saying hello. Hello. <laughs> Roxanne, um, got a message to compliment. Yes, correct. That's for Zoom. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you're talking about Zoom. Um, yeah, Roxanne, I don't know the answer to that. So I don't know whether maybe it's dependent on whether you have an education account or a non-education account because I personally have a independent business account. You know what I mean? So um, I've had the paid version for a long time and then my credit card expired on the account and I didn't realise and it didn't automatically renew my paid version, which gives me the longer sessions. So during a call, it reached the 40-minute limit and it chucked us all off and I went, oh, no. So I had to go into the account, upgrade the credit card and, um, and, and you know, get back onto their paid version. Now, the 40-minute time limit, I thought also that they had extended that, lifted the 40-minute limit for everybody, but I did get cut off on this call. So I'm not sure about that. Um, they are very active on Twitter. They have a good support section. You could ask that question of them. Sorry, I don't know the definitive answer. Solo has one input. Yep, I thought so. Rachel, happy you're not feeling so scared and I will see you tomorrow. Great. Um, Kaz has used a long cable to run from my music room along the screen board and the door frames to the router. Yeah, I know. I know. See, this is the thing I'm wondering about, just whether to get a really long lead and run it through. It's just that, you know, the dog, the kids, everyone will be walking across it and all that sort of stuff. I may, I may try that out. I may just tape it down with gaffer tape or something. Um, it's it's like diagonally across for me over there. It wouldn't need – I'd probably need a three-metre lead or something and it, it could be okay. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and, and yeah, you're right. It's a short-term solution. It's not going to be there forever, exactly. I hate things that are like – like you said, you have to run it over, over and under and around. Um, and, yes, moving stuff, it's not the end of the world, but it's just a bit of a pain if I want to come back here. So, yeah. Hey, Prudence, yes. <laughs> yes, I know. Well, Ella and I already went out for a walk this morning. We go out quite early. She insists we we cannot, um, yeah, we can't not go at, like, we have to go at 6.30 in the morning or so. Yeah, one-to-one -one sessions um, are beyond the, th yeah, it's with three or more that it cut it cut me off at the 40-minute limit, even after they had announced the the sort of the 40-minute limit lift. So I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, Earl, um, yeah, okay, Earl, no, I'll pop it in for you now. Uh, if you've already signed up for it, you'll, you should get a link to the watch page. Do you know what? I'm actually just going to, I'm going to paste the watch page link in for you. So Earl and anyone else who's coming tomorrow, this is the link to the page you'll go to watch tomorrow's session. So if you go there now and bookmark it or save it or leave it open overnight, um, you won't need to sign up to the mailing list or anything. Oh, you're already on because you've got this one probably today. So, yep. Um, comment about Zoom, extended past 40 minutes. Seems to be a bit random. Yeah, it was. I sort of was surprised. Yeah. One to one has always, yeah. If you've just got you plus one other person, the free version has always allowed you to go past forty minutes. The limitation is only on three or more people in the meeting, and then yeah, you can just start up again. The problem I had was it was my choir rehearsal. We only had a very small group, like there was nine of us or ten of us or something, and I actually said to them, "I feel like we're going to be cut off soon. Go to this place to get the the new link if I have to start a new meeting." So um, we did that. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's just it's a bit messy to do that if you've got a big group on. I think that's the the issue. If you're on their education kind of account, sign up. Like if your school has signed up, you it should be no problem at all. All right, I am going to wind up there, and 
uh, give my kids permission to jump online because they are not allowed on when I'm doing things like this. They they are under strict instructions to not watch Netflix and not play on the PlayStation. Um, so if you're coming tomorrow, I will see you then. If you are coming the next day, I'm running a third session and so tomorrow's one is aimed at uh, private studio instrumental teachers. Uh, Thursday's session, Thursday for me, Wednesday night if you're in the States or Northern Hemisphere, um, the one on that day is for elementary and middle school students. So that's more about general classroom music as opposed to today's ensemble, tomorrow's private studio teaching, mostly one-on-one, -on -one, and Thursday is the classroom music one. Okay, thanks so much, everyone. Great to see you. Really appreciate everyone uh, coming along and the lovely comments and everything else. And I really wish you all luck in Australia here. I know in the States you've been doing this for a little while at least. If you've been in China, it's probably been, I reckon, probably 10 weeks by now of remote learning if you're still doing it there. Um, here in Australia, we haven't really started in a big way. It's just starting now and we're about to embark on it. So, um, yeah, it looks like at least in Victoria they've announced eight weeks. No, what's term two? It's longer. It's like 11 weeks. Um, so, anyway, it's a, it's a longer period. Great. Thanks, Elizabeth, Judy. Simon, hello, Simon. Nice to see you on Simon Loveless. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you, guest 6024. Helen, thank you. I feel like I've seen you a few times, Helen. You must be sick of hearing my voice. <laughs> Chris, thank you. Judy, thanks, Marianne. Judith, thank you. All right, I'll stop the video. Chat window will remain open uh, for a little while and the video will stay on this page also for a little while. So if you want to re-watch bits, it'll be there for at least, um, well, at least 12 hours or so, I'll say. All right, I'll sign off now. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>